It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this very special um, presentation, special keynote. Um, and to introduce the keynote, um, I'm pleased to introduce one of McGill's uh, newest, youngest, and best faculty members. Um, Alan Downey is a Dake, a member of the um, Nas Kazadili First Nation, an assistant professor in the Department of History at McGill University, where he also teaches in the Indigenous Studies program. Beyond teaching, one of his greatest passions is working with Indigenous youth, youth, and he splits his time volunteering for a number of Indigenous communities and youth organizations throughout the year. So, Alan, if you'd like to come and introduce our special guest. Thank you very much, Will, for the introduction. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory that we are on. Um, as Indigenous peoples, we know that we live, work, or travel on someone else's Indigenous territory, if not our own, so we recognize that. As mentioned, my name is Alan Downey. I'm DeKelth. I'm a member of the Nicosley First Nation and an assistant professor in the Department of History and Classical Studies um, here at McGill, or across the street at least. And uh, I also teach in the Indigenous Studies program at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Well, as part of the newly established Indigenous Studies program, we developed the idea of an inaugural Indigenous Knowledge Holder series, which invites an Indigenous Knowledge Holder to spend a week at McGill and in community to share their scholarship, work, or advocacy. Indigenous Knowledge Holders, whether they be wampum belt holders, storytellers, artists, activists, hereditary title holders, or academics, encompass generations of knowledge of Indigenous communities, and the series seeks to act as a bridge between that knowledge and the institution, while placing an emphasis on community collaborations and partnerships, through things like workshops and community presentations. Well, part of that series has asked our featured knowledge holder to present here today. I would like to thank MISC, the Dean's Development Fund, the First People's House, the Ganawage Culture Center, and the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies for helping make this series possible. This year, it is with great pleasure that we welcome uh, the Indigenous Studies Program and Canada on the Global Stage welcomes Leanne Simpson. Leanne is a prolific Mississauga Anishinaabe storyteller, scholar, and activist that has played a significant role in the decolonization and resurgence of indigenous nations through her literary and social activism and really helping us to imagine a reality that we cannot yet face or experience as indigenous peoples. A graduate of the University of Manitoba where Leanne earned her PhD, her debut collection of short stories titled Islands of Decolonial Love was nominated for a relit award in 2014 and her acclaim, Dancing on Our Turtle's Back, has been adopted by university courses across Turtle Island, or North America. In 2014, Leanne received the RBC Taylor Emerging Writer Award, and her paper, Land as Pedagogy, received the 2014 Native American and Indigenous Studies Association Award for most thought-provoking paper. For those interested, a number of Leanne's books are on sale at the Miguel Bookstore. So please help me in welcoming our special keynote for today, Leanne Simpson. Hi friends. I'm a Mississauga Anishinaabek and our territory is on the north shore of Lake Ontario. I begin today with an introduction that has been used for thousands and thousands of years by Mississauga and Anishinaabek people when we are visiting the territories of other nations. We tell our clan first, where we come from or where we're living now, and where our home is. The last thing we say is our name. The next words out of our mouth are words that speak to the recognition and acknowledgement of whose lands we're visiting on and they invoke a political relationship, a diplomatic relationship that aligns my actions with the people with whom I'm visiting. It's a recognition of the autonomy of those indigenous nations. It's an acknowledgement of the authority of their governing structures. And it's an affirmation in this case 
of the ongoing relationship and treaties my people have with the Mohawk people based on the very best of both of our nation's politics. These are not just words we throw around. They are a tiny part of the political practices that Anishinaabe and Rotanishoni peoples have been engaged in for thousands of years. And they are coded into diplomatic practices, our ceremonies, and our treaties. So those are my first words. I'd like to thank Alan and Will in the MISC organization. And it's so wonderful to see so many students in the audience. Thank you for coming. <laughs> So we're just at the 100th day mark of the Trudeau government, a government that has made a lot of promises to indigenous people. And in coming into power has potentially signaled a desire to change the relationship between Canada and indigenous peoples. We've seen the prime minister smudging, posing for selfies with our leaders, acknowledging indigenous territories, appointing indigenous people to his cabinet, calling the inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women. <laughs> it's a friendly crowd. <laughs> and promising to implement the recommendations of the TRC, for example. Gestures at this point that perhaps signal at least a superficial change. Indigenous responses to this range from hope to cynicism to all kinds of critical analysis. A lot of new conversations are happening. I want to talk today about the conversation we're not having. I want to talk a little bit about the elephant in the room, the one at the root of everything, the one that we all like to avoid, land. <laughs> I've got one fan. <laughs> I'm going to work on that. <laughs> we're talking, we're not talking about dispossession, the removal of indigenous bodies from indigenous land, yet this is the primary relationship between indigenous peoples in Canada. Indigenous bodies are not just flesh and bones, but they're political orders. They house all of the relationships that give us meaning. And indigenous bodies are in the way of natural resources development. Indigenous bodies get in the way of settlement. Indigenous political orders get in the way of Canadian sovereignty. Indigenous bodies attached to and in love with indigenous land is a problem for settler colonialism. Dispossession has come in many forms, all of them horrific and all of them violent. Bodies have been removed from our lands through Canada's interpretation of our treaties through policies like the Indian Act, the Comprehensive Land Claims Policy, self-government policies, residential schools, day schools, sanatoriums, and the public education system. Through gender violence and the targeting of indigenous women and two-spirit and queer people, through industrial contamination, encroachment, imposed poverty, and I could go on. This is not just in the past, it's ongoing every year. Indigenous peoples have less access to land the system of settler colonialism maintains this dispossession. This is the root. Yet there is nothing more important to us as peoples than our relationships to our homelands, our love of our families, land, our cultures, our languages, our political systems, our intelligence systems are so great that it is worth putting our bodies on the land to protect those relationships. Those relationships are the basis of everything meaningful in our nations. This past week, Scott Gilmore wrote a blog post for McLean's in response to the recent horrific tragedy in northern Saskatchewan. His hard truth was that he thinks northern indigenous communities should move to the cities as a remedy for the social ills they face. He was met with fury from indigenous people on social media and I'm not going to comment on the recycled paternalism, the racism, the poor analysis, and the disregard for indigenous intelligence that peace represents. But I do hope by the end of my presentation, you'll understand how infuriating this is for us. I do hope you'll understand how important the land is to us. I do hope you'll understand that figuring out how to share land in this country without anyone leaving 
is the most critical issue of our times in terms of indigenous state relations. Now, now this one's gonna be a little bit more fun, <laughs> now that we have that out of the way. The first, the next little story I wanna share with you is a very, very ancient old story that comes from the Mississauga Anishinaabek. And on one hand, it's about the origin of maple syrup or maple sugar. And on the other hand, it's about something else. My version of this story is called Quezens Makes a Lovely Discovery. Que is our word for woman, and Quezens means little woman or girl. So Quezens is out walking in the bush one day. It's Zigwan, the very first part of spring. The lake is opening up. The snow was finally melting. She's feeling that first warmth of spring on her cheeks. Nikichinendam, she's thinking, I'm happy. Then that Koizans, who's out walking, collecting firewood for her dodome, decides to sit under Nenatagok maple trees. Maybe just stretch out, maybe have a little rest, maybe gather firewood a little later. Oh, Nikichinendam Nungam, I'm feeling happy today, says that Koizans. And while that Koizans is lying down and looking up, she sees Jidimo up in the tree. Bojo a Jidimo. I hope you had a good winter. I hope you had enough food cached. But Squirrel doesn't look up because she's already busy. She's not collecting nuts. No, Gawin. She's not building her nest. Gawin, not yet. She's not looking after any young. Gawin, it's too early. She's just nibbling on the bark and then doing some sucking. Nibble, nibble, suck. Nibble, nibble, suck. Quezens is feeling a little curious, and so she does that too on one of the lower branches. Nibble, nibble, suck. Nibble, nibble, suck. Mmm. This stuff tastes good. It's real sweet water. Mmm. Then that Quezens gets thinking, and she makes a hole in that tree, and she makes a little slide for that sweet water to run down, and she makes a quick container out of birch bark, and she collects that sweet water, and she takes that sweet water home to show her mama. That Dodome is excited and she has 300 questions. Ah, Quezens, what is this? Where did you find it? Which tree? Who taught you how to make it? Did you put tobacco? Did you say miigwech? How fast is it dripping? Does it happen all day? Does it happen all night? Where's the firewood? Quezens tells her Dodome the story. She believes every word because she is her Quezens and they love each other very much. Let's cook the meat in it tonight. It will be lovely sweet. Nahao, nahao. So they cooked that meat in the sweet water. It was lovely sweet. It was extra lovely sweet. It was sweeter than just that sweet water. The next day, Quezens takes her mama to that tree and her mama brings Nokomis and Nokomis brings all the aunties and there's a very big crowd of Machi, Sagi, Kanishna by Quewak and there's a very big lot of pressure Quezens tells about the squirrel. Quezens does the little nibble nibble suck part. At first, there are technical difficulties and none of it works. But Mama rubs Quezens back and she tells Quezens that she believes her anyway and they talk about lots of variables like heat and temperature and time. Then Gizis, the sun, comes out and warms everything up and soon it's drip, drip, drip. Those aunties go crazy, sasakwe, dancing around, hugging a bit too tight, high kicking and high fiving until they take it back home and boil it up and boil it down into sweet, sweet sugar. Ever since then, those machisagi kanishinabe kwewek collect that sweet water and boil it up and boil it down into that sweet, sweet sugar. All thanks to Kwezens and her lovely discovery and to Ajitimo and her precious teaching and to Nanatagook and their boundless sharing. Last spring, while I was with my family tapping a stand of maple trees, I remembered that this was one of my favorite stories. It's one of my favorite because nothing violent happens in it. At every turn, Quezens is met with very basic core Nishnabek values, love, compassion, understanding. She centers her day around her own freedom and joy 
I imagine myself at seven running through a stand of maples with the first warmth of spring marking my cheeks. I imagine everything good in the world. My heart, my mind, my spirit are open and engaged and I feel as if I could accomplish anything. In reality, I have to imagine myself in this situation because as a child, I don't think I ever was in a similar situation. My experience of education from kindergarten to graduate school was one of coping with someone else's agenda, curriculum, and pedagogy, someone who is neither interested in my well-being as a quesans, my connection to my homeland, my language or history, or my Anishinaabe intelligence. No one ever asked me if I was interested in, nor did they ask for my consent to participate in their system. My experience of education was one of continually being measured against a set of principles that required surrender to an assimilative colonial agenda in order to fulfill those principles. I distinctly remember being in grade three at a class trip to the sugar bush and the teacher showing us two methods of maping maple sugar. The pioneer method, which involved a black pot over an open fire and clean sap, and the Indian method, which involved a hollow out log in an unlit fire with large rocks in the log to heat the sap up, sap which had bark and insects and dirt and scum over it. The teacher asked us which method we would use. Being the only native kid in the class, being kind of a badass, <laughs> I was the only one that chose the Indian method. But things are different for this Khoisans. She has already spent seven years immersed in a nest of Anishinaabe intelligence. She already understands the importance of observing and learning from our animal teachers when she watches that squirrel so carefully and then mimics its actions. She understands embodiment and conceptual thought when she takes this observation and applies it to her own situation, making a cut in the maple tree and using a shunt. She relies upon her own creativity to invent new technology. She patiently waits for the sap to collect. She takes that sap home and she shares it with her family. Her mother in turn meets her daughter's discovery with love and trust. Kwezen's watches as her mama uses the sap to boil the deer meat for supper. When she tastes the deer, the sweetness, she learns about reduction. When her mama and her go to clean the pot, she learns about how sap can be boiled into sugar. Kwezen's then takes her elders to the tree already trusting that she will be believed and that her knowledge and discovery will be cherished and that she will be heard. Kwezens learns a tremendous amount over that two-day period, self-led, driven by both her own curiosity and her own personal desire to learn. She learned to trust herself, her family, and her community. She learned the sheer joy of discovery. She learned how to interact with the spirit of the maple. She learned both from the land and with the land. She learned what it felt to be recognized, seen, and appreciated by her community. She comes to know maple sugar with the support of her family and elders. She comes to know maple sugar in the context of love. And to me, this is what wisdom looks like within Chi Sagik Nishnabek context. It takes place in the context of family, community, and relations. The land, aki in my language, is the in the story, is a teacher. It is knowledge. It is medicine. It holds everything that is meaningful for indigenous nations, peoples, communities, and families. Stories hold the land, and they connect us to the land. Younger citizens might first just understand the literal meaning. As they grow, they can put together the conceptual meaning and with more experience with our knowledge system, the metaphorical meaning. Then they can start to apply the processes and practices of the story in their own lives. When I have a problem, I'll call my aunties or my grandparents. And the meaning making becomes an inside phenomenon. After they live each stage of life through the story, they then can communicate their lived wisdom through six or seven decades of lived experience and shifting meaning. This is how our old people teach. They are our geniuses because they know that wisdom is generated from the ground up, that meaning is for everyone, and that we're all better when we're able to derive meaning out of our lives and live our best selves. Different versions of this story happen all over our territory every year in March, when the Anishinaabek return to the sugar bush. Kwezens might be threatened, 
by land theft, environmental contamination, residential schools, state-run education, colonial gender violence, but Quezens is there anyway, making maple sugar as she has always done in a loving, compassionate reality, propelling us, propelling me, to recreate the circumstances within which this story takes place. Quezens challenges me to rebel against the permanence of settler colonialism and not just dream different realities, but to create them on the ground in the physical world despite being occupied. Quezens, a little girl, brought maple sugar to the Anishinaabek. The production of maple sugar has sustained the Anishinaabek for generations. It was one of the cornerstones of our economy, a medicine. It holds stories and ceremonies and is part of our political system. Quezens changed her nation. But what if Quezens had no access to the sugar bush because of dispossession or environmental contamination or now global climate change? What if she was too depressed or anxiety ridden from being erased from Canadian society, removed from her language and homeland and targeted as a squaw or a slut or a drunken Indian? What if the trauma and pain of ongoing colonial gender violence made it impossible for her mama to believe her? Or for her mama to reach out and so gently rub her lower back at that critical point? What if the same trauma and pain prevented her aunties and elders from gathering around her and supporting her when there were technical difficulties? What if colonial parenting strategies positioned the child as less believable than an adult? What if Quezens had been in a desk at school that didn't honor at its core her potential within Anishinaabek intelligence? Or if she'd been in an educational context where having an open heart was a liability instead of a gift? What if she had not been running around, exploring, experimenting, observing the squirrel, completely engaged in Mississauga Anishinaabek ways of knowing? What if she hadn't been on the land at all? What if Quezens lived in a world where no one listens to girls? Or where she had been missing or murdered before she ever made it out to the sugar bush? A couple of years ago, I was one of the, the people involved in the Idle No More movement. And uh, in, in, in my travels around um, speaking to the issues that we were bringing up at the time, I kept getting asked the question, what do you people want anyway? Sometimes it was asked nasty, sometimes it was nice, but I thought it is very important to be clear. And so this is my answer to what do you people want anyway? I want my great grandchildren to be able to fall in love with every piece of our territory. I want their bodies to carry with them every story, every song, every piece of poetry hidden in our Anishinaabe language. I want them to be able to dance through their lives with joy. I want them to live without fear because they know respect, because they know in their bones what respect feels like. I want them to live without fear because they have a pristine environment and clean waterways that will provide them with the physical and emotional sustenance to uphold their responsibilities to the land, their families, their communities, and their nations. I want them to be valued, heard, and cherished by our communities and by Canada, no matter what their skin color, their physical and mental abilities, their sexual, gender, or relationship orientation. I want my great-great-grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren to be able to live as Machisagik and Anishinaabek, unharassed and undeterred in our homeland. The idea of my arms embracing my grandchildren and their arms embracing their grandchildren is communicated in the Anishinaabe word kobade. According to Elder Edna Manitowabe, kobade is a word we use to refer to our great-grandparents and our great-grandchildren. It means a link in a chain. A link in a chain between generations, between nations, between states of being, between individuals. I'm a link in a chain. We are all links in a chain. Doug Williams, a Mississauga Anishinaabek elder from Curve Lake First Nation, calls our nation Kinagachi Anishinaabek Ogming, the place where we all live and work together. 
Our nation is a hub of Anishinaabe networks. It is a long Kobode cycling through time. It is a web of connections to each other, to the plant nations, the animal nations, the rivers and lakes, the cosmos, and our neighboring indigenous nations. Kinigachi Anishinaabek Oguming is not a nation state. It is an ecology of intimacy. It is an ecology of relationships in the absence of coercion, hierarchy, or authoritarian power. Kinigachi Anishinaabek Oguming is connectivity based on the sanctity of the land, the love we have for our families, our language, and our way of life. It is relationships based on deep reciprocity, respect, non-interference, self-determination, and freedom. Our nationhood is based on the idea that the earth is our first mother, that natural resources are not natural resources at all, but gifts from our mother. Our nationhood is based on the foundational concept that we should give up what we can to support the integrity of our homelands for the coming generations. We should give up more than we take. It is nationhood based on a series of radiating responsibilities. This is what I understand our diplomats were negotiating when settlers first arrived in our territory. This was the impetus for those first treaties. Anishinaabe freedom, protection for the land and the environment, a space, an intellectual, political, spiritual, artistic, creative, and physical space where we could live as Anishinaabe and where our Kobode could do the same. This is what my ancestors wanted for me, for us. They wanted my generation to practice Anishinaabe governance over our homeland, to partner with other governments over shared lands, to have the ability to make decisions about how the gifts of our mother would be used for the benefit of our people, and in a manner to promote her sanctity for the coming generations. I believe my ancestors expected the settler state to recognize my nation, our lands, and the political and cultural norms in our territory. My nationhood just doesn't radiate outwards. It also radiates inwards. It's my physical body, my mind, my spirit. It is our families, not the nuclear family that has been normalized in settler society, but big, beautiful, diverse, extended multiracial families of relatives and friends that care very, very deeply for each other. This is the intense love of land, of family, and our nations that always has been the spine of indigenous existence. The fact that I am here today is a miracle because it means my family, like every indigenous family, did whatever they could do to ensure that I survived the last 400 years of violence. In order for my Kobode to survive and flourish the next 400 years, we need to join together in a rebellion of love, persistence, commitment, and profound caring. The last thing that I want to share with you this afternoon is a really short video in another part of my life, I'm a poet and I work with indigenous musicians to perform little poem songs. And I want to share one with you that's been made into a video and it's called Leaks. It's based on a story of me and my daughter, Minuewe Beneshi. Her name means beautiful sounding bird. And she was about five years old at the time. This happened. It happened in May. We were out with Doug Williams and some friends of ours and we were picking wild leeks north of Curve Lake, Ontario. Wild leeks are like wild onions. Um, so we had picked these leeks and we were driving home and we ran into a very, very racist man who was working for the county. And he, he, he screamed at us and he yelled some horrible things that my daughter heard. And this was the first time that she had been introduced to that, that part of Canada. She was extremely upset. She couldn't talk about what happened for months and months. I felt horrible as a mother because my job was to protect her and I'd failed. And I couldn't get her to talk about it. I wanted her to know that it wasn't her fault and that she shouldn't feel ashamed. So I was speaking to my friend Tara Williamson who is a Korean Anishinaabek singer-songwriter in Peterborough. And she suggested that, that, I, uh, that I write about it. And so I wrote a poem. She, I sent it to her. She sent the song back. We performed it a, a little bit in Toronto and in Peterborough. And then we were approached by Kara Mumford, who is a Métis filmmaker, and she asked if, if she could make a film about it. We agreed, and then Kara asked if Minoue would dance in the film. Minoue was reluctant because she doesn't think my poems are cool. <laughs> <laughs> 
but she decided she wanted to be in a film. And so that next year, um, this group of indigenous women took this little girl back out onto the land. We picked leeks. They talked to her. I bit my fingernails in the car, <laughs> and we made this film. And it uh, premiered, I guess, a year and a half ago at Imaginative in Toronto, and it's called Leeks. perfect for this world. The immediacy of mosquitoes, humidity choking breath, my beautiful singing bird. Five-year-old Kichidakwe, crying silent, petrified tears in the back seat until the dam finally bursts. You are the breath over the ice on the lake. You are the one the grandmothers sing to through the rapids. You are the saved seeds of allies. You are the space between embraces. She's always gonna remember this. You are rebellion, resistance, reimagination. Her body will remember. You are dug up roads. 27 day standoffs, the foil of industry prospectors. She can't speak about it for a year, which is one sixth of her life. For every one of your questions, there's a story hidden in the skin of the forest. Use them as flint, fodder, love songs, medicine. You are from a place of unflinching power the holder of our stories, the one who speaks up. The chance for spoken up words drowned in ambush. You are not a vessel for white settler shame, even if I am the housing that failed you. Miigwech, you've been a fantastic audience. Thank you very much, Leanne. Um, I'm getting choked up. I've seen it a couple times, but um, it's really hard to capture um, how important Leanne has been to the Academy, even though that's not her focus, um, and the impact she has had, the impact she's had in the Academy and communities, and even in individual lives such as myself, where I'm trying to go back to my language, I'm trying to go back to my traditions, and there are things in the way, but Leanne is kind of that light, uh, an get, demonstrates the opportunity that there is for us to be able to do this, these things and to think critically about them going forward. With that, um, we do have some time for some questions. You've heard it before, but it would be great if they were questions, not statements. Um, we want a, a fair chance for Leanne to be able to, to answer these questions, and a lot of people have come to, to hear Leanne speak today. So um, with that, if there are any questions, please come on up to the mics. And I might get Leanne to return to the mic as well. Questions? I'm excited to be able to ask a question, although I can barely speak after seeing that beautiful film. Thank you for sharing that with us. I'm really honored to be in the room and see that with you here. Thank you. Um, 
This microphone's really dull. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. Um, I was hoping to, this is a, um, I'd love to hear you speak about your writing uh, because, um, you know, you talked about how it's important not just to dream different realities, but to create them. And I was wondering, you know, you create such beautiful uh, creative work as well and what you, how you think about the role of that and what you do. What was, so what was the question? How I think about writing? Yeah, in relation to creating different realities. I think it's really important, it's been really important for me um, to be clear and to articulate um, what we want as Indigenous people. And for me, it's been really important to look at um, things like what, what, are indig what do Indigenous political systems look like? What does our system of governance look like? What does education look like? What are some of the, the deeper philosophical um, concepts that are encoded in our language. So I really fell in love with, with Anishinaabe thought and with Anishinaabe language maybe 20 years ago. And so I've really based my practice working with, with elders and hunters and trappers and being on the land and trying to figure that out. Because I'm interested in a fundamentally different relationship to Canada than the one I have now. But I think that it's, there's been a lot of damage um, caused by, by the last four centuries. And so um, I think that I want to, when I step up to the mic, I want to come um, from a place that's grounded. I want to have a voice that, that knows who I am as an Anishinaabe person. And I want to be able to articulate those alternatives and not just articulate them. I want to have, you know, collectives of people that are embodying those alternatives. So that's very much my, my process of my life and, and, uh, and my writing. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Oh, there. Mm. <laughs> um, I love the land, and I'm almost done with a master's in urban planning, and I'm interested in going into land use planning. And I feel very worried about doing that in a way that's participating in colonialism and disrespectful. And so I'm wondering what you think is the most responsible way for colonists to relate with the land. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that one of the things that's happened in Canada is that my community and your community are very segregated. And I think the stories and the realities and the truths that my communities hold, um, I, don't, I don't get to talk to Canadians very often. I don't get to have that vehicle. And, and I, as a person, get to do it a lot more than the most Indigenous peoples. So a lot of the time, our stories and our voices are getting filtered through the mainstream media. They're getting filtered through, through, through different things. And so I think one of the things to do is to develop relationships, re reciprocal relationships, relationships based on listening with local Indigenous people. I think that's really, really important. I think seeking out that knowledge because we've now got um, we've got quite a few people that are, are teaching and researching and writing and making films. Uh, we have lots of journalists. We have um, people that uh, are telling our stories, but it's still very difficult to sort of get them in the mainstream. We have the same kind of um, almost placing indigenous peoples as victims and tragedies, that's when we make it into the news. So I think anything that you can do to seek that out, I think the fact that you're asking that question is pretty significant. Because I think not a lot of people have asked that question in the past. Thanks. Thank you very much for sharing, and particularly the song and video. Uh, I teach political science to college students, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about this uh, notion of indigenous political systems. This sounds very interesting, and it's something I'd like to learn more about. Yeah, so we have, um, we have academics that study that, so people like Glenn Colthard from UBC, um, people like Kara Ladner from the University of Manitoba. Um, but each indigenous nation has its own, own system of politics, its own way of governing, and they look very different. So the way that the Haudenosaunee and the Mohawks govern themselves are very different than the way that the Anishinaabe govern ourselves. Um, there's been tremendous impacts on that through the Indian Act. 
Um, but in a lot of indigenous nations, there's a resurgence and there's people that are wanting to figure out different ways of making decisions, different ways of relating to each other as collectives, um, different ways of interpreting the treaties according to those political traditions. And so um, I think that that field for me um, holds a lot of hope and a lot of possibilities for building a different relationship with Canada. Yeah. I'm probably going to tread on a lot of toes with this question, so let me explain why I'm asking it. In all the years I was working in development, mainly in Africa, <clears throat> I was struck by how so many of the issues we were dealing with were similar to the issues that our colleagues in what was then Indian and Northern Affairs were dealing with in Canada. So several times we got in touch with them to say, you know, let's have a chat and see if we can cooperate. And they were always very nice and they would receive us. Never was there any take up whatsoever. And I've watched since then how they've dealt with issues relating to development of indigenous peoples. And my question is, have they become part of the problem? Have they got past their sell-by date, the Department of whatever it's called now, Aboriginal Affairs? No, they are, they are the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, first of all, for your stories. Um, I said earlier that I study uh, microbiology here at McGill, but I, in different clothes. I've been a spoken word poet for a few years, and my question for you is, where is the space for storytelling in today's society? And what has been your biggest challenge as a storyteller? That's an interesting combination, spoken word and microbiology. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> I like diversity. Um, I actually have biology degrees, too. Um, I haven't had a, a lot of challenges as a storyteller, actually, compared to the rest of my life. Um, and I started storytelling because I wanted my children to grow up with their stories and I wanted them to be surrounded by their stories. I wanted to wrap them sort of with blankets of indigenous stories, of Anishinaabe stories that they could carry through your, their lives and use when they had different problems and issues come up. Um, so storytelling for me has been, that kind of storytelling has been a really beautiful way of, of connecting. I think as an academic, um, I think storytelling provides a vehicle for me at a keynote like this to connect to the audience in a different way. And I think that's really, really important. That's really important in terms of my own Anishinaabe uh, intellectual traditions. It's very important within our knowledge system to have the heart and the mind connected. It's really not um, celebrated too much in the academy, right? We like to be just in the head. Um, but I think it's bringing it into the academy has been a way of, of having different conversations and shifting the relationship. I think oral storytelling in indigenous communities is this, the oral tradition is just this beautiful system of connecting and of affirming and of creating little islands of decolonial love. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, Leanne. Um, and thank you very much for your attentiveness and for inviting us here. Um, it's great to be a part of the MISC kind of family um, and look forward for the Indigenous Studies program uh, to continue to build on the success of MISC and, uh, and have a nice kind of comfy home in the Institute. So thank you very much. We'll uh, invite Will to come up and say some closing remarks. In my job, I have to read a lot of books, because I'm a professor. Um, but in the last, I would, I, long, long, long time, the book that I've learned the most from is uh, Dancing on Our Turtle's Back, which I really think you should all read, Leanne's book. Um, well. So that concludes today's um, um, part of the conference. Um, you're invited to a reception, which is in what is something called the East Lounge which I guess is, which way is east? <laughs> that way, I don't know. Um, anyways, you'll f okay, that way. Um, it's supposed to start at six, but I imagine you can start milling around 
now. So thank you all, and uh, thank you again, Leanne and Alan, and we'll see you all uh, at the at the in the lounge at the reception, and then hopefully tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>